Let's dive right in. The simple idea here is to take a model from Blender and export it directly to PowerPoint in 3D. Right away, I'd like to be clear that this applies to PowerPoint 365. If you're working with an older version, I cannot guarantee these options will be available. In this video, I'll be working in Blender 2.92, but any version from 2.9 onward should be fine. Before we get started in Blender, let's go to PowerPoint. In newer versions of PowerPoint, under Insert, we see an option for 3D models. This will allow you to pull from a reasonably extensive library of stock models available, but it also allows for custom models to be imported. To use your own model, simply select Insert Model from this device, choose the file that you'd like to add, and then you can either adjust the 3D object or you can add various animations to it. For now, let's switch over to Blender and get started. The quick version of this tutorial is very simple. Select the object you'd like to export, in this case the default cube, go to File, Export, and choose GLTF 2.0. This should be visible by default, but if you can't find it, try going to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and then searching GLTF, and make sure that this box for Import Export GLTF 2.0 format is checked. If it is, you should have no issues. Once you've gone ahead to File and Export and chosen GLTF 2.0, you'll be greeted with a series of options. For format, stick to the binary.glb format as it will bundle everything for you. You can also add copyright information as desired. Under the Include tab, select Limit to Selected Objects and make sure that your desired object or objects are selected. I recommend exporting individual objects. Other than that, the only real settings that are worth changing are under Geometry. You want to make sure that Apply Modifiers is checked if you're using modifiers in your scene but don't want to apply them before exporting. Otherwise, the default settings that you see are largely sufficient. Simply export the file and use it as desired. When exporting 3D models from Blender with GLTF, we have to consider the materials being used and the UV maps applied to our object. Though GLTF will export simple colors, it does not capture procedurally added material information. More plainly, that means that if I try to make something metallic, glassy, or shiny, I cannot actually export that 3D data. You can see a very clear comparison here between rendered PNG images of the cube with different materials applied compared to the 3D imports of the cube with the same material applied. The information is simply not exported. The simplest way around this problem is to use pre-existing image textures. When exported, the texture will be bundled with the file and can be seen in PowerPoint, as we can see with this solar cell cube right here. Note, however, that the lighting is not what you would see in the render view in Blender. In most cases, this is the extent of the workaround. Great resources already exist for free image textures, and they should cover most use cases. I personally use cc0textures.com, and I'll show how to quickly set up those textures in Blender. To start, I'm going to come to cc0textures.com and look for a solar cell. Choose the specific variant that you would like, and then download it in the resolution of your choice. I recommend a higher resolution, 2K kind of at a minimum, but 4K or higher as needed, and you can change file type depending on your needs. Back in Blender, we're going to start by coming to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and we're going to make sure that we have the Node Wrangler add-on enabled. To start in Blender, we're going to open two windows. The first is a Shader Editor, and the second is a UV Editor. Many simple objects are given a UV map when they're added to the scene. For instance, if I tab into edit mode, you can see that I already have a UV map for my cube. If I had to specifically unwrap it, I could select everything by hitting A and then hitting U. You can see I have different options such as unwrap, smart UV project, cube projection, cylinder projection, sphere projection, etc, etc. Generally speaking, smart UV project will be the way to go unless you know you have a predefined object. In this case, I'm going to work with the default UV map. If you're working with a complex model, you'll have to make sure it's properly unwrapped and full unwrapping is beyond the scope of this video. Once your object is unwrapped, we're going to simply create a new material. You can see for the default cube, we already have the generic principle BSDF, but if we assume that we had no material, we would simply select new. From here, I'm going to hide the side panel with N, shrink our UV window, and now to set up the image texture with Node Wrangler enabled, I'm going to click on my principled node and press Control, Shift, and T. This will bring up an option to import a texture. I'm going to navigate to the solar cell texture from earlier. You can see that the textures have a number of different maps for the different inputs. 
You can add all of these separately with Control T, but Control Shift T will simply allow you to box select all of the maps at once, and it will do all the material setup for you. Simply click Principled Texture Setup, and you'll see all the nodes connect appropriately. In most cases, especially for exporting GLTF, you only really need a color, roughness, and normal map. Your downloaded texture may have options for ambient inclusion and displacement. You can add those as well, but without some extra workarounds, Blender won't export that data to the GLTF file anyway. We can now tab back into object mode, come into a material preview, and see that our texture has been applied. If you wanted to, or had to, add in some of your maps using Control T instead of Control Shift T, it's important to note some of the details here. The only map that's going to be set to color data is the base color map. Otherwise, metallic, roughness, and normal, as well as displacement, are typically set to non-color in the color space. Once all this is done, you can now export your model and use it in PowerPoint. Again, note that the lighting is different, as the GLTF is providing its own. As far as I can tell, this isn't something that's easily adjusted. For now, we'll simply select our cube, come to File, Export, GLTF 2.0, navigate to our desired destination. I'm going to quickly name this file Solar Cell Cube. And then we'll make sure that we have Limit to Selected Objects. And we'll go ahead and check the other boxes. In this case, we have no modifiers, so we'll simply export. Over in PowerPoint, we can simply insert 3D model this device and then choose our solar cell cube. And we're now free to manipulate and use this cube however we'd like. In most cases, I recommend sticking to existing image textures, but there are some instances where specialized procedural textures may be necessary. You can see here a simple node setup for making a perovskite texture. I have a tutorial for this and I'll link it in the description, but I would want to use this specific texture on the model that I'd like to export into PowerPoint. To do that, I'm going to have to bake the different maps of this texture and use it as an image. To start, I'm going to change the render engine from Eevee to Cycles. I'm also going to make sure that this texture is not applied to a cube, but to a simple plane. So we'll start by deleting the cube, adding in a simple plane, coming to our materials, and adding in that perovskite. To bake this procedural texture into individual images, I'm going to start by simply hitting Shift A in the node editor and adding in an image texture. We're then going to create new. I'm going to name this perovskite underscore 2K underscore color. And I'm going to set the texture resolution to 2K by simply holding down over both of these with left click and then multiplying by two. For higher resolution, try 4K. This specific image texture is going to be our color input. So we're going to make sure that the color space is set to sRGB. Once we've done that, we're going to make sure this node is selected, that the plane is selected in the 3D viewport, then we'll come to the render tab, use the default number of samples, and under bake, we're going to change the type from combined to diffuse, limit the contribution to just the color, and then we can go ahead and press bake. Once you do this, you'll see texture bake appear and you'll have to wait for a little while. Once the image is finished baking, open an image editor, choose the specific image that is now available, then under image, choose save as and save to a specific directory. I recommend using this type of file naming as it will allow for Node Wrangler to import your texture more easily later on. After you've saved your color input, you'll then have to repeat these steps for the roughness and normal. You don't really need to worry about the other maps as the GLTF cannot really use them anyway. So for instance, shift A, image texture, add new, and then in this case, we're going to call this perovskite 2K roughness. And for the roughness and the normal, make sure that you set the color space to non-color. Then make sure that this is the node selected, the plane is still selected, and under bake type, simply choose roughness, go ahead and bake, and then repeat these steps and do the same for the normal texture. In terms of the file type for your image textures, I'm saving these as JPEGs, but you're likely going to be better off with PNG, TIFF, or even OpenEXR, depending on the quality that you need your image texture to provide. Now that we've converted our procedural texture into a series of images, we can apply it to any object that we'd like. In a new scene in Blender, I'm going to grab the default cube, open a shader editor, select my principled BSDF node, hit Control shift t 
navigate to where I created the new perovskite texture, open the color, normal, and roughness maps, and simply press and it will set it up. You'll notice that if I hit Z and come into material preview, that this is quite a large resolution texture. If I wanted to, I could change the scale and this will update the GLTF. However, you will also see this clear and obvious tiling. Blender Guru has a uber mapping node that somewhat resolves this issue, but it's a little bit easier if you just preemptively use the scale that you want when baking the original texture. With this, we can finally grab our custom image, go to file, export, GLTF 2.0, and once again, we're simply going to include the selected object, make sure that is just our cube. We'll also apply modifiers, assuming we had any, and then we'll simply export this as our perovskite. Transitioning over to PowerPoint now, you can see we have a variety of different 3D objects with our custom texture available imported into PowerPoint. This is a good chance to discuss some common issues you may run into. You can see from the monkey head here that there's a clear seam in the texture. You can also see this in the sphere. This is a result of how the UV map has been created for the object. If you run into this problem, you can either unwrap the object a different way and then try and re-export it, or you can simply change the 3D view of the object so that you do not see the difference in the UV map. It may also be a problem where the image resolution is not high enough. If that's the case, what you're going to want to do is rebake your texture at a higher resolution. You may also run into issues if you've adjusted a object using modifiers and then applied those modifiers on export. You can see, for instance, in this cube where I've done some simple hard surface modeling that the cuts that I've created using booleans have distorted the texture. To fix this problem, all you have to do is apply the modifiers before exporting and then unwrap the object again. And as you can see in the cube on my right, this has corrected the texture. If you have to unwrap your object again, I usually recommend going with Smart UV Project. It will typically do the job just fine. And when you export, the shading issues should be resolved. Now that we've gone through the actual workflow of using 3D models, I'd like to discuss some of the benefits and limitations of doing so in PowerPoint, as well as some additional resources worth checking out. PowerPoint is widely used in the sciences, and the ability to integrate 3D is a nice touch. If you're working on slides or a model and collaborating with someone unfamiliar with 3D software, it gives them the opportunity to make simple manipulations such as exploring different perspectives in a very easy to navigate interface. Many of the animations are excellent placeholders and can be more than sufficient for constructing simple or even complex figures. This can also circumvent the lengthy render times required in most 3D applications. With that said, 3D figures are not inherently better than 2D, and the files PowerPoint uses to create 3D figures have some significant limitations. Complex animations that involve changing the object's underlying mesh or materials are largely off the table. As it happens, GLTF files can store animation data, and if you add animations using keyframes in Blender and export those settings, you'll actually be able to see them if you open them using the Windows 3D viewer. Unfortunately, much of this data is not currently accessible to PowerPoint at the time of recording, though future updates promise this extra functionality. As we've already seen, the main limitation though is that GLTF does not preserve specific lighting or scene elements in the same way that a rendered image or animation will. This means customizing lighting and materials is more limited. If you require fine control over the animation and the scene setup, then embedded or separate video files are still the way to go, in my opinion. It is also a simple truth of academia that software compatibility is never guaranteed. My boss used to say that everyone loves a video or animation, but it has to work. If you're presenting on a machine other than your own, particularly at a conference, this is essential to keep in mind. As I said before, newer versions of PowerPoint support 3D, but older ones may not. To wrap up, I want to discuss some additional resources. Because GLTF files depend so heavily on the use of image textures, it makes far more sense to rely on free and existing options than to render out procedural variants. CC0Textures.com has been mentioned on the channel before and already in this video and is a fantastic resource. I've discussed free material and image resources previously, and I'll link that video in the description. In addition, the Smithsonian Institute's Open Access Initiative has over 2.8 million images, the 3D ones, largely in GLTF. These are definitely worth checking out, particularly for biologists and archaeologists. Fair warning though, the resolution size of the full resolution files is huge, so keep that in mind. For a significantly longer look at GLTF files and their ins and outs, I recommend checking out the series by AGI and ANSYS Company on YouTube, which provides all sorts of additional details and is an 8-part, 3-hour-ish playlist. I've added a link to the first video in the description. 
It includes some breakdown of the file types and also ways to add in data such as ambient occlusion if that's necessary for your models. And with that, thank you for coming out. If you found this useful, consider subscribing, sharing with your friends and colleagues, or supporting me on Patreon alongside my existing supporters who have my thanks as always. So until next time, you have yourselves a great old day.